Yeah, we're going to be talking about amateur radio repeaters uh, 101. So we're going to cover a little bit about uh, what a repeater is, how it operates, um, and also building a repeater and some tips and tricks uh, along the way as well. And there's a few photos as well. So I'll I'll point out these, uh, these photos um, as we go along. Uh, these two photos here, these are taken, obviously the one on the right is taken in winter. Um, gets rather cold here on our mountains. Um, so that one's uh, a, a tower which uh, we had an amateur radio repeater on and it's covered in uh, in ice. So that's a, that's a common sight here. And uh, the photo on the left is a, is a repeater system which we just commissioned actually in the last few months. And that's a two meter repeater with a, uh, we did an upgrade of the rack and uh, also some extra uh, uh, components and bits and pieces in there too. So that's those uh, those first two uh, two photos there. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I've, as was mentioned, I've got a um, YouTube channel, Ham Radio DX. Uh, there's a few specific videos on repeaters, which is uh, which are, are on the channel. If you want to uh, check that out, I've been a licensed ham for about. Uh, I think it's 19 years this year, 20, 20 years next year. And I've been doing repeaters or doing, doing, um, repeater, um, uh, builds and commissioning repeaters for probably about 15 years, I think of that uh, amount of time. And that kind of started when I, uh, where I lived, I lived in a valley and it had no repeater coverage at all. And I struggled to get into the repeaters that were, um, in town. So I couldn't, uh, and I was just starting as a, as a ham and I sort of, you know, the first thing you do is you, as a ham is you get sort of a two meter radio and you try to talk to, to locals, uh, you know, maybe a club or something like that. And, uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't speak to them. So I kind of went down the train of building my own repeater and, uh, and being able to link it to uh to something else so that i could uh so that i could cover my area so that's how it kind of started and it's grown over time and it's one of my passions i think in amateur radio i um, enjoy getting something on the air and working um, building it all and having it having it uh it all running so i think that uh it's it's fantastic when you can do that and when you uh when you build something you get a satisfaction of people using it as well which is uh, what i enjoy uh, so the first thing we're going to talk, talk about is repeater basics. So we're going to talk about what are uh, repeaters. So uh, repeaters are basically used to extend communication beyond simplex range. So um, if you're uh, familiar, obviously, with simplex, it's uh, one-way communication. Someone talks and uh, the other person receives their transmission and then they talk back. Repeaters are a little bit different. They operate uh, duplex. So they transmit and receive at the same time uh, on slightly different frequencies. And they're usually located up on high locations, such as a hilltop, a building, um, to maximize their range. And to sort of visualize that, here's a little bit of a diagram, and this is from the ARRL handbook. And um, I encourage you, you can pick up um, an a uh, ARRL handbook has uh, some information on repeaters. If, uh, if you'd like to look up some more information. So you can see at the top of that diagram, there's uh, a range of mountains between station A on the left and station B on the right. So uh, obviously station A and station B's coverage area, they can't speak with one another because uh, the, the hills are blocking the signal. So you've got their station C in the bottom, bottom diagram. That's the repeater station. So basically repeater... Station C sits there, and uh, Station A on the left can talk via that via that repeater to to Station B on the right hand side there, and vice versa. And uh, obviously, you would also cover many more areas as well. So that kind of highlights the difference between simplex um, Station A and B not being able to talk with one another, uh, and and duplex with a repeater there um, in that bottom bottom diagram. So nearly all repeaters, they also transmit vertical polarization. And uh, this is mainly due to mobiles, so vehicles, um, mobile installations and portable handhelds. When you hold a, a handheld radio in your hand, you generally have the antenna pointing straight up rather than horizontal. Um, so that's the reason why uh, most repeaters transmit vertical polarization um, for that as well. There's also some advantages of of vertical polarization with 
um, antennas. Uh, for instance, uh, a dipole, if you vertically polarize a dipole antenna, um, you don't have nulls off the end as if you would if it was horizontal. So it's actually omnidirectional uh, in the vertical plane. So uh, in that regards, it's great because you can use a dipole antenna and it's going to give you omnidirectional coverage um, rather than if you were to have it horizontal, then you're going to have a, a couple of nulls off the end. So um, it's also handy in that regard too. So uh, how does it work? As I mentioned before, the repeater has two frequencies. Uh, it has an input frequency, which the repeater listens on. And whilst someone transmits on that input frequency, it simultaneously retransmits them out that exact same signal on an output frequency. So real, real time, uh, full duplex, which is... Um, uh, a really cool and a little bit of a challenge to try and get get working correctly. Um, it can be it can be a little bit um, a little bit difficult, but we'll go through uh, why that is and how how you can you can make it work basically. So here's a diagram of that in action. Uh, you can see here the uh, two vehicles, and if we start with the one on the right there, the vehicle on the right transmits on. 146.34 and you can see that arrow then up towards the repeater the repeater receives it on 146.34 and then it retransmits it out on 146.94 600 kilohertz uh, difference there so uh and you know uh, vehicles and portables and mobiles and base stations they all listen to the repeater's uh output frequency and they all operate on the input so that's basically how a repeater operates in this full duplex um, sort of system, uh, simplified. So repeaters are also in lots of different bands as well, and they all have advantages and disadvantages of each frequency. Uh, you can uh, see uh, I've got a repeater antenna there on the right, and I'll describe what that repeater antenna is uh, in a moment. But the repeater bands, which are available for us amateur radio operators, are 10 meters, so 28 megs to 29.7. The, the repeaters, uh, there's about four internationally allocated channels on 10 meters, uh, 29, 620, 640, 660, and 680. There are also a couple that are in between on odd um, frequencies as well, but they're the main ones. So we do have FM repeaters on 10 meters. Uh, there are also repeaters on six meters as well, 50, 50 megs. Um, they're kind of up in the, the the 52 to 54 megahertz range here in, in Australia. I think in the United States, there there's a couple down at 51 as well. And uh, they're used for uh, long distance communications. Um, so, so worldwide, worldwide, definitely on 10 meters. Not so much worldwide on six meters, but you can definitely work six meter repeaters when the bands are open. Um, usually in the middle of summer is the most common and uh, you can work up to 1,500, 2,000 kilometers um, repeaters quite easily. In fact, there's a six meter repeater, which I commissioned here in Hobart and it shares the same frequency as a repeater in uh, Brisbane, near Brisbane. And uh, during the summer, it's not uncommon. Uh, they have a net every Friday night and I'll sometimes hear VK4 stations over 2000 kilometers away um, talking via our repeater and uh, not realizing it. So uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, the disadvantage, so the advantages of 10 and six meters is that you can get long, long range and long distance. Um, and especially to ground wave, you can get a lot of range out of those frequencies just because they travel over mountainous terrain and, and uh, and through trees and everything like that a lot easier than some of the other bands. The disadvantage of 10 meters and six meters is that their noise levels on those bands are quite high and especially in built up areas. So if you're driving in an urban environment, if you're driving around the city or um, you're driving under power lines, uh, six meters and 10 meters can get quite noisy. Um, at home, they can also get noisy. And also, if you have a 10 meter or six meter repeater located somewhere, um, unless it's sort of right out in the middle of nowhere on a on a hilltop with no other power or no other transmitters around, it can also get quite noisy as well. Um, 
to try and find repeater sites that that work for those for those bands. But uh, they're, they're there and they do work. Uh, the next one and probably the most common is VHF on two meters. So two meter repeaters are everywhere, um, probably because it's the uh, the best performing band for for what it is. Um, two meters is is very easy to to um, to for for range and also not as noisy as I mentioned as ten and six. So those repeaters they're suitable for the urban, suburban, and the rural areas. So sort of sort of a almost a perfect repeater um, band to be using two meters. The next one's up is 70 centimeters. So this is uh, 420 to 450 megs ultra uh, UHF. Uh, UHF repeaters are really good for built up areas around buildings um, because of the smaller wavelength. They can penetrate into buildings a lot easier um, or so they can bend around corners and refract off um, uh, hard surfaces like buildings or or rock uh, rock faces. We've got a large mountain here, so that ref we can refract seventy centimeters off of that reflect. Sorry, um, so they work well for that. So they're kind of effective for both local and medium range communication, two meters and and seventy centimeters both. There are also some other bands, and they're less they're less common, but you do get repeaters on these bands. Uh, in America, they have the 1.25 meter band, which is 220 megahertz. That performs similar to two meters, but also with some 70 centimeter characteristics because it's sort of halfway or not quite halfway, but um, sort of uh, in between those two bands. Uh, they also have 902 megahertz as well, a 33 centimeter band, which is uh, another interesting one too. And then we also have um, super high frequency, so 23 centimetres. Uh, we've got uh, no 23 centimetre repeaters here in my state, but I know on the mainland we have a few. And uh, those those frequencies are mainly for experimental uh, experimentation, um, amateur television repeaters, so those that repeat TV signals, um, D-Star, um, digital modes, those sort of things. Um, and... Between all of these bands, if you think about the differences between them, um, I like to give an example with if you have two stations, say say two repeater stations, if you have one on six meters and one on two meters, if they had identical um, receiver sensitivity, they had identical transmit power and they had the exact same antennas, the six meter repeater is going to have a signal that's 10 dB or 10 times stronger than the two meter station. And that's because of the path loss path loss on six meters is a lot less than two meters. And then if you compare six meters to 70 centimeters, the difference is going to be 20 dB. So a hundred times. Um, so I guess with, to summarize that you've got to have a look at what's going to fill the coverage area or, or what's going to be your particular need. So here, where I live, we've got a lot of mountainous terrain and uh, it's hard to cover in some valleys and shadows where the signal just doesn't get down. So 70 centimetres is not quite the ideal band to do that on unless we had lots and lots of repeaters um, because of the short, shorter range um, communication um, aspects of 70 centimetres. So we uh, decided on two metres because it's um, the most common and um, and also um, everyone's sort of got radios for two meters as well, and it's easier to program radios for that uh, for that frequency. So, so we settled on two meters, but we still have ten meter repeaters, six meter repeaters, and seventy centimeter repeaters as well for various other functions as well. So, um, but yeah, it's just uh, just something to think about. So there's lots of uh, different types of repeaters. And, oh, sorry, I did forget to mention the photo. So the photo on that previous slide is um, a six-meter repeater. You can see at the top of the um, mast there, the uh, vertical with the radials. So that antenna is a uh, what we called here in Australia a station master vertical antenna. That was originally an antenna for, 10, uh, for 27 megahertz CB. Uh, basically what I did was I shortened that um, antenna, uh, remade the coil at the bottom, added some radials and turned it into a five eighth wave uh, vertical on six meters. And I've done a conversion article right up on my 
um, website and you can do a search for that and find that on my website, um, hamradiodx.net. And there's also a couple of folded uh, dipole antennas there at the top of the mast, which are uh, for um, commer a commercial system that's also there. Uh, so repeater types. Now um, that um, picture on the right-hand side there is uh, at another one of our sites. We've got a IP router in the top, um, which we get internet to this site using a point-to-point -point link. And there's a couple of Yaesu digital repeaters um, underneath there. So they run uh, D-Star and I think um, C4FM um, and I think also DMR as well, uh, those repeaters. So the various different types that we have, uh, frequency modulation, so analog repeaters. These are the most common and they're used for voice communications. Um, so basically what happens is the repeater receives an FM signal on that input frequency. It simply just passes the audio through a repeater controller to add identification and um, Roger beeps and anything else that you need to to control the audio and it retransmits that out to the transmitter on an output frequency. So that's pretty basic uh, how the analog um, system works. We've also got digital voice repeaters. So as I mentioned, there's that one on the right-hand side, the Yosu one. So these use uh, digital modulation. These are for um, improved voice quality and error correction. So with an analog repeater, you'll notice when you're using it, you'll get fade or flutter um, or sort of um, you'll you'll get a lot of QSB, a lot of noise if the signal decreases. Whereas with digital repeaters, you don't get that. You get a uh, noise-free digital voice signal right until you lose signal and then it just goes silent and you don't have um, you don't have a a, a a signal anymore and uh, you might get a little bit of a garbled audio and then it will just drop off. So uh, digital repeaters have that advantage that you get basically a perfect audio all the way until it, uh, it there's no more signal and you get no noise. Uh, so the digital voice modes, which are the most popular and common, are DMR, so digital mobile radio, D-Star, uh, digital smart technologies for amateur radio, um, usually found on ICOM, ICOM radios or Kenwood. And uh, C4FM, which is uh, Yaesu, Yaesu System Fusion. So they're the most popular um, digital modes. I did forget to add in here too, uh, APRS, so Automatic Positioning Radio System, um, Packet Radio, digi peters they're also repeaters as well. And they receive analog, analog packet radio. They store it for a brief second and then they retransmit it out. Um, so there's also those as well, which which we use. Um, digital repeaters also, they're a lot better on the spectrum um, efficiency. So in some areas, we're running out of spectrum space. So um, they use less uh, bandwidth than a FM stand, uh, a standard FM analog repeater. They uh, use around about, they have a bandwidth of about 12 and a half kilohertz rather than an FM analog repeater, which is 25 kilohertz. And you can do some other cool cool functions with them as well. Uh, now, there's also crossband repeaters. So crossband repeaters are, um, uh, as in the name, they receive a signal on one band and then they retransmit them onto another band. So, for instance, two meters to 70 centimeters or the other way around, 70 centimeters back to two meters. Um, so you might have a simple crossband repeater already in a radio that you own. Some Yaesu radios, um, mobile radios, they have crossband mode in them already built in. Um, some handhelds also do it. Um, I think Kenwood have some handhelds and a couple of the Yaesu radios also do crossband repeat. Um, so they uh, they, they uh, do that uh, really easily. And it's actually probably the easiest repeater to build. The disadvantage, of course, is that you need to operate between two bands, which can, can be a bit difficult sometimes. And a crossband repeater is effectively how an FM satellite works. Um, uh, an FM satellite just receives on one band and retransmits it out on the other and uh, you can actually listen to yourself in real time as you do that as well with via a, a satellite so they're basically cross band repeaters and um, so yeah if you've got uh, two different uh, bands uh, and you can listen to them at the same time then it, it can also be an easy way to to get a repeater on the air 
and uh, also requires minimal equipment as well. You don't need some of the more fancy equipment that we're going to go into um, shortly. So uh, just a little bit of lingo um, that we'll go through for those who might not be aware or might be new hams as well, um, what, what those are. So uh, what we're going to do is um, just go through those. Sorry, I'll just minimize that window. Uh, channels. Channel is referred to as the pair of frequencies that a repeater operates on. So you might, you know, say I'm going to a particular repeater channel. That's the the frequencies that that they uh, that the repeater's on. Uh, offsets the difference between the transmit and the receive frequency. So you might say uh, I've got an offset of 600 kilohertz. So that means that the transmitter and the receiver is 600 kilohertz um, offset between each other. And going, sorry, with offset as well is a shift, which I didn't mention. So you can go plus 600 kilohertz or minus 600 kilohertz. On 70 centimeters, um, generally it's about five megahertz. So plus five megahertz, minus five megahertz. Um, so that's uh, that's what offset, uh, offset means. Uh, you've got identifications. So that's usually in CW, in Morse code or, or voice ID. That's the most common. Uh, digital repeaters also encode their identification or their call sign in the digital stream, and usually they're read out on a display on a radio as well. Uh, timeout timer. This is the amount of time that someone can talk through a repeater before it times out and stops transmitting. So this is to stop um, signals locking up the repeater and having the repeater just transmit for hours and hours on end. Um, and in some cases, it's also a legal requirement. So here in Australia, we don't have a specific set amount of time. Um, I believe we need to identify every 10 minutes. The repeater needs to identify every 10 minutes. And the other uh, legal aspect too is that the um, repeater shouldn't retransmit a non-legitimate signal as well. So it can't just transmit noise or it just can't transmit constantly all the time if there's no one there. Um, so... The other legal aspect is this, that if it ever gets locked up, if someone accidentally leaves their radio running and it's on the repeater and it locks up the repeater, um, then the repeater has to time out after a certain amount of time. So we generally set that at about three to five minutes. So you can talk via repeater for three to five minutes each over before it times out. A courtesy tone. So this indicates um, when the timeout timer resets. So some repeaters have this, some don't. Um, it's also known as a Roger beep. So when you let go of the button, you might hear a beep. That generally means you're good to transmit again and the timeout timer has reset. So you've got another three or three to five minutes or whatever the time has been set to to uh, to, 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 uh, to talk again. Uh, doubling. Doubling's uh, interesting and you've probably heard it yourself as well. Uh, it's when two stations are trying to talk on the repeater at once and they'll sort of be a bit garbled up. Uh, that's uh, that's that's uh, what doubling is. Uh, the tail or the squelch tail. So this is the amount of time that the repeater transmits after the user lets go of the button and stops transmitting. So generally, if you're talking via a repeater and you let go of the button, you'll hear a beep. And then you'll hear a tail, so uh, effectively dead air. And once that drops, then the repeater has stopped transmitting. So this generally varies a little bit um, between a few seconds to tens of seconds. And uh, and it's sort of whoever's built the repeater sets that. A subaudible access tone or a CTCSS tone. This is a tone which you can't hear during uh, when you're listening to it. Um, this is to allow access to the repeater and usually it's to mitigate interference. So uh, most repeaters will be set up in carrier carrier operated um, squelch. So as soon as someone keys up the repeater, the repeater's receiver then sends a signal to the controller to say, hey, I've got a signal, um, turn on the transmitter. Uh, sometimes if you've got interference or you've got um, something which say that's another transmitter maybe might be keying the repeater up all the time. Um, 
you don't really want that. So you need to add a subaudible tone to the repeater to stop it from keying up all the time. Um, so that's what a, a CTCSS uh, tone is. Full quieting, uh, this just basically means that you're noise free into the repeater. So if someone says, can I have a signal report? You could say oh, you're full quieting. I can't hear any noise on your signal. Uh, key up. So this is basically just activating a repeater, keying it up, um, pressing the button and and having it come back to you. Uh, Kachunking is similar to keying up. This is when you're doing it, when you, uh, you press the button without your call sign or without identifying some, some, there are some legal requirements depending on the country. Um, here in Australia, you can do a test transmission without your call sign. Um, so um, generally it's better off to do your test transmission with your call sign so that you can identify it. But occasionally you might just need to, to key it up just to, uh, to see what signal it is or if you're testing an antenna or something. So that's what kachunk means. Um, picket fencing. So this is also called flutter. Uh, so when you're driving along um, due to Doppler shift and also due to um, propagation between your moving vehicle and the stationary repeater, you'll see the signal strength will vary up and down as you're driving along. Um, so that's also called uh, flutter. It sort of sounds a little bit like uh, listening to um, something through a picket fence, uh, listening to audio through a picket fence. And it's sort of, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to, think of the word but it sort of chuffs in and out and uh, the noise sort of can, can come and go quite rapidly um, and it's more noticeable on the higher frequencies because of the smaller wavelength you're you're passing through the the uh the wavelengths of um uh, sorry through the nulls of the signal so you'll see that uh you'll see that uh, come and go quite rapidly and link um Repeaters can be linked, so they can be via radio links, the internet, or, or some other way, and we'll go into a little bit um, shortly about, about linking as well. A little bit on etiquette. So calling CQ on a repeater generally isn't used. Um, it's generally just your call sign, and then you might say listening on whatever the repeater is. So um, here in... In uh, Tas in Hobart, I'd say um, VK7HH listening on uh, VK7RHT repeater, which is the call sign of the repeater, or 146-700 repeater, or whatever frequency the repeater is, some something like that. Um, not really that important. Um, you could say, you know, just VK7HH listening or your call sign listening. That's generally generally um, the the etiquette there, but CQ is generally not used. Um, it's a good idea to pause between transmissions and just wait for that Roger beep um, if if there is one, and that just tells you that the timeout time is reset. So you can make sure that you don't, uh, you know, you're not stepping over anybody, and that uh, there's a there's that pause between so that you don't reactivate the timeout timer by accident. Now, if there's a conversation going on and you want to jump in to someone um, who's talking on a repeater. Uh, generally, what you would do is you would wait until they finish um, speaking, and then you would jump in real quickly with your call sign. Just announce your call sign um, after you hear that beep, um, or or if there's no beep, or if you want to get in, just announce your call sign straight after they've uh, they've finished speaking. So that's the easiest way to jump in on a conversation, and uh, and usually what will happen is is if you hear someone, then you would just acknowledge them. And then call them in, call them in on the conversation as well. So um, it's as, uh, as simple as that. Um, when you, uh, uh, there's no need to sort of, you know, do a full full call, um, just just announcing your call sign is is uh, good enough to, to, uh, to jump in. Uh, if you have any doubts though, just listen. And if you listen on the air, you'll hear the way that people, um, sort of move back and forth between other people on the repeater and you can generally gauge uh, what the, you know, how the, how the etiquette is and how to, how to, uh, to jump in on, on conversations and all that sort of thing. But if you have any doubt, then just listen. Um, I like to, and I, I do this just in amateur radio in general, I like to add over after every over. Uh, and I generally just do that because it means that once I say over, 
then someone knows that I'm going to let go of the button and, and that I've finished. So it's a lot easier for people to call in um, and, and, and jump in if they wish to. And, um, and, you know, some, some people, they, uh, some amateur radio operators, especially if they're new, they might have a bit of mic fright and they might not know what to do. Um, and if you hear someone um, who you haven't heard before and they jump in, then yeah, definitely, um, you know, be, be a little bit patient with them and, uh, and invite them onto the air and um, you know, um, it's, it's not really, you know, there's, there's etiquette, but it's not really something that needs to be followed to the letter. It, it can be, it, it can be varied a little bit. So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's always a good thing. Um, the only thing is on repeaters, just avoid long overs, uh, because of the repeater timeout. Um, if you talk for quite a long time, the repeater will stop transmitting and someone will miss the part of the conversation that that you were speaking about in the time that uh, that it's timed out. So um, as I said before, three to five minutes is generally about the most common. Um, don't kachunk your repeater without identifying a call sign. I mentioned that before. Um, it's it's fine if you're just doing a, a simple test, but if if you're kachunking it all day, it can get a little bit annoying. So um, best to, to use your call sign. Um, and I added a little bit in here about deliberate or malicious interference, and and we've experienced this before as well. Um, the best thing to do is to just don't acknowledge it. Uh, if you hear someone who's interfering, who's not licensed, or you just don't know where the interference is coming from, just uh, just don't don't acknowledge it or comment about it. Just completely ignore it, um, and that way they eventually whoever's doing it will become bored because they're not getting uh what they want you know they're probably trying to annoy somebody or trying to annoy you into responding and if you don't do that they'll get bored and they'll they'll stop uh they'll stop um doing it um and if you want to if it if it's a if it's a uh if it's a signal that you're not quite sure where it's coming from perhaps it's someone whose radio is locked onto the repeater by accident which we've had before as well um have a listen on the repeater's input frequency and see if you can hear them directly. So that way you can try and, and track them down. And and if it is a malicious uh, or deliberate interference, then you can report that to the relevant um, authorities uh, who, who govern um, amateur radio in uh, in whatever country. So here in Australia, we have the, the ACMA. I'm not sure what it is in, uh, in Sri Lanka there, um, the, the Radio Communications Authority. So um, that's the best way to, to deal with it. Okay, so building repeaters, and we'll move into um, what you need to to put one together. And uh, the first thing is is to acquire a suitable site. So you um, you can see there that's a, a very lovely, um, very lovely day actually. Uh, photo there, looking over the um, part of the city of Hobart where I live. Uh, this repeater site is our main broadcast and transmitter site located uh, above Hobart. Um, it it gets all sorts of weather. Um, in winter, it can get below um, freezing very, very easily. Even in summer, it can get below freezing. Um, so, uh, but it's it's a perfect site um, because it's the highest mountain and uh, directly overlooks a majority of the population. So, um, it's very much uh, the best site in uh, in in where I live here. And all the television, and unfortunately all of the radio and television broadcasters are also there. And that poses a bit of a challenge for us as well. Uh, so you want to find a site that's high over the terrain that you want to cover. Um, if you've got flat terrain, then it will be probably the highest building. But generally it's on top of a hill or on top of a mountain somewhere um, overlooking where you want to uh, to cover. Um, ideally you want it to be standalone, um, not shared with any other transmitters. So I mentioned that before with this particular site, we are sharing with broadcast broadcasters, FM and, and television that run um, several hundred kilowatts of power. So we need to add extra filtering to get it to, to, to filter out all of that other RF um, RF signals, all that RF noise and, and, and grunge. Um, so we want to get rid of that and we just want our signal to be received by the repeater. And that's the good thing too, because a repeater is a single frequency, a single channel, we can design filters that only 
receive on that particular frequency and they get rid of everything else. So um, we have bandpass filters. We also have notch filters, which we employ to try and get rid of that. Sometimes it's, in, it's, it's impossible to do, um, but you kind of can only work with what you've got. And with this situation, it's, it's, it's obviously the best site because it can see the entire population. So um, we're, we're a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, limited with what we can do there. Um, if you have a commercial site, which is what we have in this uh, particular case. So when I say commercial, shared with other broadcasters, shared with two-way radio, FM, television, that sort of thing, you'll want to get a lease from whoever the site owner is. So in this case, our site is owned by a television company. So we have a lease from them. Uh, they'll also uh, you, uh, want to organize access to the site. So for that, you'll need to have um, safety and inductions for the site um, to make sure that you're doing work that will not endanger both yourself, but also the public um, and anyone else who might visit there as well. Um, and with access as well, relevant keys. Um, and also if you're visiting a site, you'll have to log in and log out as well to make sure that uh, the site is secure because a lot are behind fences, um, gates, buildings, doors. Um, so you'll have to gain access to that sort of thing. They'll also probably ask you for engineering drawings. So they'll want to know what antennas you're going to be putting up, what cables you're going to be running, where you're going to be running them, how your rack's going to be installed in the repeater site, uh, sorry, in the in the building, how your, um, you know, what radios you might be using, are you using quality equipment, that sort of thing. So some places might ask you for that as well. And they'll also ask, probably ask you for money as well. And uh, I guess with one tip that I wanted to say on this is, and, and there's a lot of um, people that do struggle to get access to really good sites, um, and it's usually the money that is the problem. Um, a lot of the time it's it's due to just these uh, commercial operators wanting to make sure that they keep everyone doing the right thing, um, that by being by their rules and by uh, their uh, their standards and their specifications. So if you're ever looking to try and get access to a repeater site, the best tip that I can say is that, make sure that you stress to them the importance of the repeater to the general community and especially in an emergency situation. So uh, we're very reliant these days on mobile phone networks. We're reliant on shared radio networks for emergency services, but these systems can still go down as, as, as much as we have uh, HF radio and that sort of thing as well. Uh, our repeaters also come in, in, in handy for emergency situations. So, um, if I was going to, to, to somebody, I would say exactly what I was doing, put down all of the equipment and, and the proposal that you want to do, and just say to them that, um, it's very important that this be a, a service for the community. And, uh, and it, with this particular site, we managed to negotiate a, a pretty good deal, um, with, with them. And, uh, we signed, I think a 10, 10 year lease. So, um, so, uh, so some, some situations you might not be able to negotiate, they might not want you there, but, um, in most cases, if you do persist a little bit and you try and talk to the right people, you can gain access for, for an, for an amateur radio repeater. Um, so uh, that's, that's what I would say anyway. So, uh, how to build a repeater. And this is another, um, diagram from the ARRL handbook, which sort of shows it off, uh, rather well here. Um, these are the various repeater components um, of a basic analog repeater system. So you've got the transmitter there. Um, you've got the receiver. So you can see um, all of the, the, the transmission paths and the audio paths. So basically um, you've, you've got those, uh, those two there. Uh, you isolate the transmitter and the receiver using a duplexer, which is in the middle. And that basically isolates, yeah, the transmitter from the receiver using some filters. We call them cavity filters. And this allows the repeater to operate um, full duplex. And this is usually into one antenna. So uh, because your transmitter frequency and your receiver frequency are usually so close, uh, you need to uh, 
notch out the transmitter from the receiver and the receiver from the transmitter um, so that they don't interfere with one another. Because if you have ever used a two meter radio, for example, on a frequency and you've got another two meter radio sitting on a close frequency listening to a signal, if you transmit on one of those radios, the other radio will, will like, will be desensed and you won't hear that signal anymore or it'll be very weak while you're transmitting on that close frequency. So that's kind of what we're dealing with here. And uh, the transmitter and receiver is is then interfaced to a controller. So you can see the path there, the, the signal comes in via the antenna. It goes through the duplexer into the receiver. Out of the receiver comes the audio from the receiver into the controller. Then you've also got control as well. So you've got the, the CTCSS signal to say when it's receiving that subaudible tone. And you've also got squelch as well to or carrier squelch. Um, carrier operated relay is also the other word for it to know when the receiver is actually receiving a legitimate signal. Uh, the controller sees this. It then says, okay, there's a signal here. Let's turn on the, the transmitter. It sends transmit audio to the to the transmitter it sends push to talk to the transmitter to key it up. And then that then goes around back into the duplex and back, back out the antenna. And, uh, and then there's uh, obviously the, the power supply there too. Uh, the controller can also do um, other things, other functions using DTMF. So you can turn the repeater on and off. Uh, you can change the timeout timer. You Some controllers also have digital outputs where you can control um, a relay. So you might be able to turn on a fan or turn on a um, turn on and off uh, another portion of the, the repeater. Some controllers can also um, momentarily switch a relay so you can uh, reset the, the entire system, maybe power off the power supply briefly if there's a fault or something, and then it can all come back up. Uh, so they can do many, many functions as well. Uh, and and uh, we mentioned about the antenna as well. Um, you can use one antenna uh, if you've got enough isolation in your duplexer. If you do duplex a spec, uh, spec to isolate the transmitter from the receiver, and uh, you can also use two antennas if you want uh, extra isolation. Uh, the only disadvantage with using two antennas, one for the receiver and one for the transmitter, is that sometimes you'll get a bit of a, a an imbalance between your coverage area. So um, if you've got a, say, your receive antenna right up high and your transmitter antenna down low, maybe they're spaced out by five five meters on the tower, then obviously you're probably going to receive a little bit better than you're going to transmit. But in some cases, that's, that's completely fine and it works quite well. Uh, the other bit of the repeater system is the feed line. So you need high quality cable, so Heliax or Hardline. And we'll go into some of these um, bits and pieces uh, shortly about what what to use and what not to use. Uh, and you've also got the power supply, obviously, as well. So here's a, uh, here's a repeater, uh, one of the, the many standard repeaters that I use. And I was talking to Ron earlier uh, before we started the presentation about this uh this particular model and i believe you've got some of these in sri lanka as well so these are the unilab kl series of repeaters these were manufactured in western australia by the company unilab which they don't uh, they don't exist anymore but there are similar companies that still do build these and they're good because they're modular um they've got um you can you can take bits out you can swap them out you can swap boards out and it's it's they're really easy to work on so on the left there, I've got the uh, we've got the the receiver. Um, then we've got in the middle the controller. Uh, there's an exciter, which is basically a low powered transmitter, and then the pa the power amplifier to boost it up to about fifty watts. So that kind of shows you an entire repeater system built into the one uh, into the one box. And in this particular case with this this repeater, I take the main main board out and um and because we don't need it and i sort of wire up everything directly and uh, that saves a little bit of power as well which uh, is important for things like solar repeaters as well uh so duplexes um duplexes they allow uh you as i mentioned to transmit and receive at the same time through 
usually one antenna. Uh, they're tuned cavities, and there's a photo there on the right-hand side of these, the um, uh, tuned cavities cans, which are in series, and their job is to allow the transmitter and receiver very close in frequency to operate at the same time, so they notch out um, one from the other. And you can see there in that uh, diagram from uh, VK6UU, you've got a pass and a reject frequency. So the way they work is each cavity passes one frequency and then you tune it so that it rejects the other frequency. So in this case, if it was on the transmitter side, we'd want to pass the transmitter's frequency and then we want to tune it so it rejects the receiver. And uh, on that diagram there, you can see that it's 600 kilohertz apart. So it's a typical two meter um, two meter offset and uh, there's 35 db of, of isolation there you can see that on the left hand side that chart it's got uh, the db measurement so that's uh, that's for one cavity filter what we want is we want the the loss on the pass frequency to be as little as possible so generally less than 2 db for the entire system so these are these these are these cavity filters are in series so um, if we've, for instance, in that photo there, we've got three on the transmit side and three on the receive side. We want to make sure that the total loss is less than about 2 dB because 3 dB is half your power. So um, there's a little bit of a compromise, but yeah, less you want to aim for less than 2 dB. And you want that reject or that isolation to be as high as possible. So generally, I kind of say if it's better than 90 dB, you can generally transmit into one antenna. If it's less than 90 dB, you might need to separate your antennas out. So if you're looking at buying a duplexer, um, building one is very difficult. You can build them, but uh, if you're buying them, then uh, look to, to, to get something that's got more than 90 dB of, of isolation. Um, and you can see in that diagram there, they work by coupling loops. So your input um, RF goes in on one side, uh, it couples into the can um, and you tune a, a tuning rod up and down for your pass frequency. And on the coupling loops, there'll also be a little capacitor in series with the coupling loop and that will tune your reject frequency. So that's how, how duplexes work um, essentially. Uh, but uh, yeah, you, you can buy your own, but they're, especially at two meters, they can be a little bit difficult to, to build. But um, if you actually have a look on Google, there's ac there's lots of different, um, di um, not diagrams, uh, there's lots of different articles on how to build um, duplexes if you've got the material. Um, if you've got enough copper or something like that, you can definitely build your own. And uh, they also have specified phasing harnesses between each cavity filter as well. So um, duplexes are a little bit of an art in themselves and we could do an entire um, presentation on just duplexes. So um, it, uh, it definitely definitely is uh, a bit of an art to, to building those. Uh, feed line. So in, in duplex service, it's a little bit different to simplex because when you're transmitting in very close proximity to the receive frequency, it can create all sorts of noise um, artifacts and noise problems. And even with coaxial cable, if you have dissimilar metals in coaxial cable, so if you've got an aluminium foil shield that's over the top of a copper braid, these are two dissimilar metals. And because they're physically touching each other, this can cause RF noise. So lots of like a bit of a diode effect, lots of, of intermodulation and lots of noise. So you want to avoid um, certain cables and you want to avoid these anywhere in the system. So this includes between your transmitter and your receiver, between that and the duplexer, between that and the antenna. So you don't want to use RG58, um, RG213 or RG8, those kind of cables. Um, uh, RG... RG213, you, you probably could get away with it um, because it's um, using uh, copper, if it's using a mil spec and it's copper center conductor and a copper braid. Um, RG58 is just a little bit too lossy for that sort of thing. Um, and LMR type cables, so LMR 
240, LMR 400, they use um, foil, foil um, in their uh, shield, and they also use a braid as well. And that's just that's just asking for trouble. And when I'm talking about RF noise, what you'll hear is you'll hear crackling on the repeater. Someone might be completely noise free into the repeater with no noise, and they'll be they'll be crackle, um, and you're not quite sure where it's coming from. And this is this is where it's coming from. It's coming from either the cable or the antenna moving, um, which I'll go into shortly as well. So. Basically, um, it's best to use RG214 um, or RG400. This is double-shielded silver-plated copper. Um, so that's that that cable in the top right-hand corner there. That's RG214. And from the uh, duplexer to the antenna, it's best to use LDF or, or Heliax or hardline cable because it's low loss. Um, you It's going to be out in the weather as well. So this cable the water can't get in more than a few millimeters because of the, the corrugations in the cable, the water actually can't run all the way down the cable. Um, so, so that, uh, that, that cable's the best. Uh, antennas. So vertical polarization, as I mentioned before, uh, the main two antenna types are folded dipoles. So, uh, these are these are usually rugged, and you can stack them vertically or horizontally for uh, uh, sorry vertically for additional gain. And uh, you can see the photo there. That's a a folded dipole which we had on the top of a a very very high tower. You can see actually how high it is. Uh, you can see the the vehicle and the the other tower further down the the bottom of the hill there. Um, and that's mounted on pretty heavy duty brackets um, off the side of the tower. Um, the only problem is, is that if you do phase folded dipoles, they, they can get water in their phasing harness. So that's a, a bit of a disadvantage with, with folded dipoles. So you've got to make sure you wrap enough, uh, um, tape around them, amalgamating tape so that there's no water gets in, uh, collinear vertical antennas. These offer easy gain, but they're also not as rugged. So my tips are spend a little bit more money on a quality antenna. Uh, that's probably the most important part of the whole system is the antenna because it's going to be outside. It's going to have all sorts of weather thrown at it. You want to make sure that it's not, you know, going to, to break. Um, sometimes you don't need a lot of gain. So don't always go for the highest gain antenna uh, because gain focuses, uh, antenna gain is focused um, at the horizon of the of the antenna or at a very narrow uh, very narrow angle um, low low radiation angle so if you've got an antenna that's up high on a mountain and all of your gain is out towards the horizon but all of your users or repeater users are down in a valley below then it's not really going to work well it'll work perfectly fine out long distance but it's not going to work down into the valley so sometimes you you don't need a lot of gain um, and make sure you secure Everything on the tower that includes the anten your antenna, any other antenna that's nearby, any nuts, any bolts, any brackets, any cables, any uh, everything needs to be completely tightened down so that it doesn't move. Because once you start, once your antenna is lit up, l lights up RF. Once it starts transmitting and you've got RF in the vicinity, anything that moves can cause that duplex crackle, that noise that I mentioned before. So if you've got a rusty nut or a loose loose bracket or something and it's flapping in the wind when the wind blows, you'll hear crackle on your repeater. Um, and it, it can be quite frustrating to try and to try and find the the issue or the noise source. And uh, and as I mentioned before, if you've got an antenna on a really high mountain, sometimes you need to electrically phase the antennas so that they have down tilt, so that the main lobe of the antenna is pointed down rather than more at the horizon. So uh, that allows more of your signal to go down into, into where the users are. So in this instance here on this repeater, um, it's quite high and all of the users are down in a city, which is located actually in a valley. So this re um, particular system would require a bit of down tilt um, to, uh, to make sure that uh, the users could hear the, hear the repeater. 
Uh, a little bit about solar repeaters now. So these are off-grid repeaters, and you can see a photo there with a couple of uh, couple of solar panels um, located on a site. So these uh, these solar repeaters have solar panels, batteries that require constant maintenance. The main thing with a solar repeater system, though, is to reduce the current consumption, because when you build your system, you need to build it around how much power you have at your disposal. And an example of this is sometimes when a system is built on a solar repeater system, uh, it might be looked at as how much transmit current does it take up? And it might be like, well, if the repeater takes up 10 amps of transmit, that means that we're going to need a battery system so big. Um, I tend to not think of it as transmit because amateur repeaters are not really used all the time. They sit quiet a lot of the time. Um, and on average, it probably only transmits for, say, an hour during the day. So if you were to look at this example here, if we've got a repeater which uses, uh, which transmits one hour per day for ten a for uh, ten amps, that's ten ampere hours. If it's receiving though, if it's receiver which is for tw for the other twenty three hours of the day, if it's receiving one amp, um, if it's receiver just sitting there standby, not doing anything, just receiving. Um, in standby mode, if it draws one amp, that's 23 ampere hours already taken out of our, our battery systems. So uh, what I'm getting at here is, is that sometimes it pays to try and reduce the amount of power that your repeater system is using. So I'm, I mentioned before that repeater that I take the main board out of, when I remove that main board, it saves about half the amount of current. So um, that would then save a lot of power on our battery systems. So the second example is we have the same transmit um, one hour per day, 10 amp hours, 10 ampere hours rather. And if we just reduce the receiver down to say 300 milliamps, 0.3 of an amp, if we, if we, if I take that main board out, then that reduces over that 23 hour period, we've got 6.9 ampere hours. So we've saved 70% of our power. So, um, that way you can build your system around how much batteries you need, how many batteries you need, how many solar power panels you need. And ideally you want it to be running for several days with no sunlight because, um, you know, you might get bad weather, cloudy weather, that sort of thing. And you want to make sure that you don't, um, you don't, re um, uh, run out of battery. So size size it so you have way more power than you than you need. Um, the most common batteries are lead acid batteries because they're reliable. Um, there are lithium and lipo four batteries. They are the new rage um, lithium batteries these days. The only problem in repeater systems is they have a battery management system, so they have an electronic circuit in each battery, and they they could potentially fail. Um, if there's lightning or something like that, the, the, that system may fail. So you might have a dead battery. So I generally try and just say lead acid batteries are probably the more reliable one um, the, the, to, to use uh, if, you, if you've got access to them, of course. Uh, linking repeaters. So uh, again, here's a nice diagram of how a repeater is uh, repeater links. So from the uh, handbook, we've got a user on the left-hand side. He's on a handheld, he talks to a repeater up on a mountaintop and he can't talk directly to the user in the car. So they link a, link the mountaintop to another repeater on a building and then the user in the car can then talk via that repeater and they're all sort of linked together. So uh, repeaters can be linked together for additional coverage. This can be done with hardware. So point-to-point -point UHF links, um, so uh, um, over RF, usually it's done on UHF. Um, you can also do, uh, th these are, th this method of linking is reliable during emergencies because it's, it's using physical hardware that's powered up all the time. That's, that's there and, and good to go. Um, off air linking. So off air linking uses a, a central repeater as a hub and other repeaters then connect to it using RF. 
Um, an example is, say, a VHF repeater that can be used as a hub, and then you've got several UHF repeaters all connect to it with their own VHF link radios at each site. Uh, you can also link over the internet. So here we use all-star um, linking. So all-star link that uses repeaters, nodes, and radios to connect to a larger network um, all over the all over the world. And basically, if you have a node radio, you've probably seen on my channel, I've done a couple of videos on using all-star link to link, link between two locations. Uh, you can also build a repeater using all-star as well. So um, if you want more information on that, just Google um, all-star link and you'll, you'll find all the information on that. Uh, there's also IRLP and echo link, although they're not really uh, as reliable as all-star and not as flexible and also digital repeaters. So we mentioned DMR, D star, these already have linking built into them. They already have that inherent, uh, that, that inherent linking over the internet built in. Uh, the main disadvantage with using the internet is that they can go down in an emergency. So that's where sometimes linking using RF is best because uh, it's uh, you you're not uh, you don't have to rely on the internet. Um, so just a little bit about on maintenance. Uh, if you ever build a repeater system, maintenance is hardly ever routine. Uh, be prepared to travel to the repeater site many, many times in the year in all sorts of weather, rain, hail, snow, um, shine, uh, sunshine. Uh, when you get there, there could be a fault in the repeater. The batteries could need topping up. The signal might have changed for some reason. It might have gotten weaker. So you got to then decide, is it the antenna? Is it the coax? Has the power amplifier failed? Or maybe it doesn't receive very well. So... Again, is it the antenna, is it the coax, or has there been a new transmitter installed on the site that you're with? Perhaps that's then desensing your repeater and it's not hearing very well. Maybe the repeater's crackling or it's noisy on users, so you've got to make sure that everything on the site's secure, make sure everything metal is bonded together and it's secured, including other antennas, make sure other antennas aren't moving in the wind. And plus much more. There's so, so much that goes into maintaining repeaters. Uh, it's it's almost a full-time job. So um, if you have a repeater officer in your club or if you're uh, if if you look after repeaters, you've probably come across some of these or many, many more um, things like this. So uh, it can be it can be quite tough, but it's also quite rewarding because you learn a lot along the way. And sometimes you might have a problem. And then the next time it happens, you know exactly what to do and you know what the problem is and you can fix it straight up. And, and it's a great learning experience actually. And and I've learned a lot about just radio and everything in general in amateur radio from the work that I've done on repeaters as well. Uh, and a little bit of a tip, if you have a remotely accessible device that you can control, as I mentioned over DTMF, maybe using the repeater controller, um, you can hook that up to a relay that switches off the entire site for a second and then turns it all back on. Um, and this allows you to basically power reset the entire site um, without having to travel there. So on our particular site, we have a mountain which is closed during the winter when it snows really heavy there and we can't physically access it. But if something goes wrong or a device locks up or something's not working, say the repeater locks up, we can de we can log into it and we can turn it off. We can send it a, a DTMF code and we can uh, we can turn it off. So that uh, that is a, a very good tip to to have. Um, so I just wanted to finish off with just a couple of photos um, of some of the repeater systems that we have here in VK7. Um, so you could see there. Uh, the photo on the left there is just a basic repeater that we have on a on a repeater site. Um, we use the one again, another one of those Unilab repeaters in the top. Um, the next box down with all the the LEDs that aren't lit up. That's an ARCOM controller from the United States. Uh, the radio below that's a link radio. So this is a UHF repeater, and that link radio links into a central VHF repeater, a hub hub repeater so that off-air linking and uh and that's linked into that and then the next photo down is just an aprs uh aprs radio for uh for packet um digipeating 
And uh, and then we have another repeater, which is located in a little trailer uh, with a couple of solar panels. So that's uh, that's located out in the middle of the Australian bush <laughs> down here. So uh, so that gets uh, quite snowy sometimes, as you can see. Uh, sometimes we'll go to a repeater site and we'll have some interesting visitors. Uh, you can see there on the left-hand side, we've got a, uh, a huntsman spider, we call them. Um, they're uh, pretty harmless, but they do give you a little bit of a fright when you're pulling out a battery and uh, and you don't quite <laughs> you don't quite uh, expect to see them. Um, but they 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 won't hurt you at all, um, and they're non venomous. And uh, but but yeah, we do have them. Uh, you sometimes we'll have snakes as well, so you have to be careful of of snakes that get curled up in in uh, in all sorts of places. Uh, that middle photo is another repeater site that we have. Um, you can see in the background. There's a duplexer that I built. This is a six meter repeater. So I built some um, cavity, uh, not cavity, sorry, a, a duplexer out of some hardline LDF 750 coax. Uh, and I think I put an article on my website about building that as well, or some photos about building that. And there's lots of articles on how to build that, that kind of six meter um, duplexer on the internet as well. And uh, and the photo on the right is just of one of the towers that we have some antennas on. Um, and we have quite a few solar repeaters. Uh, that one on the left hand side there, some uh, some panels that we put up on a frame on top of a a very rocky uh, mountain. Uh, the one on the right there, some some sites require access by helicopter, so we can't physically we can physically walk there, but it's very long and difficult to carry batteries to the top of mountain tops. Um, so uh, if there's some other work that's happening at the repeater site, we might uh, piggyback on and uh, see if we can get a, a free ride. So in this case, uh, I think they were doing a, a, a battery replacement. So uh, the helicopter was going for a flight up to the top. So um, so we jumped in, some put some batteries in to, to fly up to the top of that um, repeater site. Um, I mentioned about the weather. So on the left there, there's a vertical antenna that got snapped off because of ice that built up. Uh, the ice built up on the antenna and the wind blew and snapped it clean off. So we replaced it on the right-hand side there with a, a much thicker um, antenna, which is built for um, Antarctic conditions, actually. So so that uh, antenna hopefully won't break, and it's still up there at the moment and and hasn't uh, hasn't broken. So so hopefully it doesn't uh, have any any future issues. Uh, a couple of more photos there. Uh, another repeater there on the left. Another UHF repeater that's linked into that main hub hub repeater. Um, just in another rack, we make sure that we make it all look relatively neat. Um, and um, some photos of the antennas, and you can see the the heavy duty brackets that we use, and the um, and make sure the cables are all relatively neat as well. Uh, so there's using a couple of dipoles, a couple of folded dipole antennas. And this is the difference that winter can make. Uh, you can see there the left, the the tower, the folded dipole right in the center. That antenna is the repeater antenna. Um, on the right-hand side, the exact same tower, but after um, a winter storm has come in and you can see the direction of the wind and the direction of the ice that has formed um, where the, the wind has blown the, the ice against the antenna. And this uh, this actually causes a reduction in the in the efficiency of the repeater system. The signal strength will go down because it's trying to the the ice ba basically enc <laughs> encases the entire thing, and until it thaws out and melts, um, your your repeater just might suffer in performance a little bit, and there's not really much that you can do about it. So um, so yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's what winter can do. Um, so if you want to learn more about repeaters, here are some useful resources. Uh, the number one resource I'd recommend is the Repeater Builder website. Just Google Repeater Builder um, and there's the website there. This has hundreds and hundreds of articles on all sorts of things to do with the repeaters, how to build them, the equipment you can get, where to get it from. It has basically everything you need to know about repeaters um, on the Repeater Builder website. So it's it's the best resource on the internet, and it's uh, for repeaters, and it's fantastic. So check it out. Um, I mentioned the ARRL handbook a few times there for understanding how repeaters actually work. 
Um, so you can get that from the ARRL or Amazon as well. Uh, I've got a few videos on my YouTube channel. So that includes um, some interesting things about simulcasting and voting, which we do here. So we do a, a little bit on uh, with that and All Star as well. So uh, just go to my my YouTube channel and search for for repeaters and uh, and you'll find those. And the other one is Repeaterbook, uh, repeaterbook.com. That's a website and also has an app as well. Uh, this is a repeated directory. So if you want to find any repeaters in your area um, or any information about repeaters, the the access tones or how to the frequencies that you need or the uh, the offsets, uh, these will be on Repeaterbook. So um, that's a very handy website and and, app, and application to use as well. Um, so I have some questions now if anyone has any. Thanks, Aiden, for that for a nice presentation. Unlike any other <laughs> uh, presentation we have had, I can see the full participation count still staying uh, with you, Aiden. So thanks for making so making it so illustrative as well. So folks, uh, it's time to raise your questions. I saw a quite quite a long list of questions. If anybody has anything to ask, uh, uh, now is the time. Make sure that uh, you don't repeat uh, the, the points that we discussed during the presentation. So, uh, anyone? Paranga, may I go ahead with my... Yeah, go ahead, Nadika. Yeah, hi, Hayden. I'm Nadika. That's uh, 406 uh, November Charlie Hotel. Uh, actually, I have three questions. Uh, uh, first... Uh, is uh, why 600 kilohertz why why it's not 800 or 1 megahertz and uh, my second question will be if you are uh, going for a commercial site would you prefer to have your antenna on a separate mast or the uh, main tower itself in the site uh, and uh, yeah my third uh, question is are there any disadvantages in uh, uh, RF linking repeaters? For example, say you have uh, two repeaters uh, overlapping uh, the same area. If you are, if you are, if the two repeaters are linked together, only two stations can use the uh, bo use both repeaters at once. But whereas if if the repeaters are not linked, four stations can use, uh, I mean, two uh, pairs of uh, stations can use uh, both uh, repeaters. Uh, so yeah, th those are my questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, the first question about offsets, um, that's an interesting one. And I think it has to do with on two meters because we have only four megahertz, uh, at least here. And I'm not sure in Sri Lanka, do you? We, have, do you, we only have two megahertz. You got two megahertz. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's very limited bandwidth available. So um, the there are some repeaters on two meters here in Australia that have wider offsets, uh, but it has to do with the band plans in, in the country. So the band plan is set up so that there is certain parts of the band that is allocated so some as for so ssb or weak signals some for cw some for fm um, some for repeaters and simplex so i think 600 kilohertz i'm not sure where it come from but i think it was many years ago they just decided to allocate that section of the band plan for repeater outputs and inputs and they were separated by by 600 kilohertz so that's where it come from um if there's no real band plan, then effectively you could have a you could have 800 kilohertz, you could have one megahertz if you've got the bandwidth, um, just as long as it fits in that that band plan that's been assigned. Um, as far as the the second um, uh, questions concerned with the uh, what was the second question of second forgotten. question was uh, if you are going for a commercial site, uh, do you prefer to have it on a separate uh, yeah like own private tower? Or the yep. main tower itself. Yeah, if if you can get it on your, uh, if you can get it on a separate site or a separate tower, then it would be preferred because especially if you you'd have a lot more control over it then. Um, so if, you know sometimes that's not always possible. So for instance, you might get access to a commercial site. You might be able to put your own repeater hut and your own tower there, and that's fantastic because 
you can come and go as you please and you don't need to get access to their site. Um, they might also charge you minimum amount of money for that particular um, that particular space. Um, but also if you can get access to to that, you might be able to then move your system a little bit further away from their transmitters and it might work a little bit better in your favor, uh, both in the performance of your repeater and also in the logistics of accessing the site. So, um, but in some cases you might be forced to use their tower or use their, um, their building. And I guess it's a little bit of a compromise. It depends on what they offer and what you can do, but I would always try and get your own um, space if you can. Um, and uh, and uh, as far as the linking is concerned, uh, yeah. So ideally, when you're linking repeaters, you do want them. You do want to link repeaters that do have overlapping coverage, um, because then, if say someone is um, mobile driving their vehicle between coverage areas they just need to simply change repeater um channels repeater frequencies yeah and just see which one's the best one to use um so uh the the disadvantage with using rf rf to link is you need lots of radios lots of coax you need extra antennas uh to to because you know you've got to basically put half of a repeater system to link to the other repeater. And that's why we do ours over the internet down here now, because the internet's freely available um, and it's easy then to link using the internet to another repeater a long way away, but that repeater also has internet access. So, uh, and in an emergency, our repeater system falls back to its own system. So, it's not linked anymore, but it's still a repeater system and it can operate in an emergency without the internet. So, um, but yeah, the, the, there are advantages and disadvantages of, of RF linking. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Nadeja. Uh, Dilusha, I think you've got a question. Dilusha, you there? Uh, okay. It's okay, Tarant. Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, uh, hello Hayden. Uh, this is uh, Dilusha uh, hey. from the Hotel to Oscar Delta. Uh, my question is, uh, how can we effectively uh, plan for, I say, emergencies like power outages, equipment failures, and basically uh, uh, how we minimize the amount of trips we have to make to a repeat site? Uh, so minimize uh, downtime. Uh, because we have uh, so many uh, different obstacles regarding uh, maintaining and uh, uh, our repeater systems and we we have we had uh, three but uh, now only two is operational yeah so uh, 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 give us some uh, practical tips and tricks uh, about that please yeah I, I i guess the 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 best thing to do is to make sure you have battery backup um that's the 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 main thing so the 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 main thing that will go down in an emergency situation is is power so uh if you have a repeater system even if you have mains power at the repeater site you want a battery backup <clears throat> or a generator if you can um generators can be a little bit complex and expensive but uh if you've got battery and the batteries are, are good enough to keep the repeater going for at least you know, a few days uh, while the while the power's down at, at the very least. If you can get a week out of it, that would be even better or, or two weeks. Um, maybe you can uh, switch the repeater into a low power mode maybe uh, to, to conserve energy, but ba definitely put um, battery powered at, at the repeater site. Um, and as far as everything else is concerned, uh, I guess is... I know that access to to quality equipment can be difficult. I know that um, that uh, uh, Ron was saying earlier on that I think mainly you have GM three hundreds Motorola's um, over there. If if you're using those, then you know they're pretty pretty robust type of type radios. Um, they'll 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 uh, you know they they're not likely to fail very often. Um, so if you can get as much quality uh, equipment as you can and and install those um, 
you know, so that you you have minimal maintenance if you can, um, then definitely in an emergency situation it'll 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 pay off. And um, if you have uh, several repeaters that uh, that are available for those emergency situations, then it also means that rather than one repeater being tied up all the time, you have another one that you can go to. So sometimes some uh, places might have a two meter repeater and a seventy centimeter repeater at the same site because um, you've got that redundancy. So if the two meter one fails, at least you've still got the 70 centimeter one or vice versa. Uh, so probably those two um, is, is, are some, some practical tips for, for emergency situations. Um, the, the other thing too that we also do when we install our antennas is we'll install a main antenna and then we'll install a backup antenna. So if one does happen to fail, we can easily switch to the second antenna and plug that in and then we can fix the other one maybe at a later time if we have to. So in an emergency situation, um, if for some reason your repeater antenna, you know, blows off the tower or gets hit by a piece of ice, which happens here, probably not so much in Sri Lanka, uh, or, or a storm takes it out or something like that, then you can switch to another antenna um, or at least have have some backups, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, also, uh, is there any uh, like uh, remote monitoring system? So, uh, are this, things like that we can use, uh, let's say, power resets or change the antennas or anything like that? What are uh, the options like we have? Yeah, so um, a lot of there are some basic repeater controllers. I think Ron was saying you have a lot of VK5DJ repeater controllers. Uh, they have a, I think they have a digital output, but they only have, I think, one digital output. So you could control maybe one device. Um, you can buy uh, other controllers like that Arcom controller that I showed earlier that has uh, multiple digital outputs. So you can control lots of different devices. Um, over my shoulder here in in one of the, uh, on the workbench, I have a, a special DTMF um remote control board and you wire that in series with this uh, sorry wire that in with the audio from the repeaters receiver and that's like its own separate control system so you can send you can program it up with codes and you can send it codes and it will turn on and off um, various remote remote control stuff so um, maybe you've got a link a link radio that you have to another repeater but you don't want it linked up all the time so you can turn it on and off as you need. Um, so uh, so you can buy those. I think you just Google DTMF remote. I think it's DTMF remote and you'll find those. And they come as a little kit and you put the kit together um, and, you, and you just wire that up and that uh, they, they work quite well. Um, but yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the control um, telemetry, you can get some, uh, some, um, what do you call them? Um, telemetry boards that will work over the internet um, and you can log in using the internet and you can control, control the uh, control, you know, various things and see like repeater battery voltages and all that sort of stuff. Um, APRS, you can, if you've got APRS or packet radio, uh, you can also send telemetry over packet radio so that you can measure voltages at repeater sites as well. So that's another option. Um, and uh, if you don't have internet at the repeater site, uh, you can still get point to point, um, like like a, I'm not sure if you've got ubiquity or or that sort of thing, but you can get uh, point to point IP links that you can have from say a repeater site to maybe a club member's house or someone's house that can see the repeater site. And then you can control stuff using using that link as well. So you don't necessarily need the internet at the other end. So there's a couple of different things that you can do there as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I see that Nadila has a question. Go ahead, Nadila. Okay. Thanks, Nadila. And uh, hi, Hayden. I hey. just realized that I haven't subscribed to your uh, channel. I've been watching the videos for a long while, and I just realized that. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, okay, so the question is, um, sort of basing it off of the Lucia's question, uh, 
So regarding DTM if tones to control a repeater, uh, wouldn't it also be equally easy to mess with the repeater? And how do you like you can't really do stuff like encryption over the air because that's auto regulation. Uh, how do how do you uh, suppose there's no internet, nothing, but you want to control the repeater, uh, and you only got DTMF as the option. How how does that happen? Thank you. Uh, so how does how does DTMF how does it work with DTMF? Uh, that and how to ensure like nobody with unauthorized access messes with the repeater. Oh, uh, yeah, yep, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, so uh, DTMF, uh, I've drawn, a, I've got a blank of what um, DTMF, something digital tone, digital tone, something frequency. I can't remember what DTMF stands for, but basically it's when you, it's the touch tones on your radio. Hmm. Um, so uh, you you would program whatever device, so like that DTMF remote that I mentioned before or the controller for codes to switch on and off stuff um, as you need. Some repeater controllers will automatically mute. As soon as they hear a DTMF code, they'll mute the audio coming out of the repeater. So then that way no one can sort of decode the the codes that you're sending. Um, some also require a, a, a separate CT CSS tone. So you have to send that with the code as well for it to work uh, or for the access commands to work. Um, of course, you know, someone can maybe listen to you on the input and decode the the tones. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not impossible to, to, to decode them. Um, and then I guess if you do find someone, you know, messing around and changing the, changing the stuff on the repeater and switching stuff on and off, you'd have to go and just rechange the codes again, which can be a bit difficult. Um, but I guess the only way to sort of get around that is to, is to use uh, internet linking um, with passwords and stuff to, 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 to control it. Um, I'm not, I can't really think of another way that you could do it without, I mean, we, we don't, we don't have, we don't really have that problem with, with, um, people like decoding the tones or anything like that. Um, so I haven't really thought about it to be quite honest. Uh, but yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, but they're, they're probably the, the two ways to, to, to deal with that. Um, I hope that, uh, I hope that sort of answers that. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm a, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Dan. Nadila, Nadila, sorry. Uh, I think Ron wants to dash out uh, early uh, today. So shall we pass over to Ron? I think he has to uh, ask a question or something. So Ron, uh, can you take it from here? Uh, take, take, take this, uh, take the microphone, please. We'll come back yeah, to you. Okay, later. Thanks. thanks, Taranga. Uh, Hayden, I want to thank you before I go for accepting our invitation. And I must really say that it's a feather in our cap for the Radio Society to say that we rub shoulders with the Ham Radio DX guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask a question before I go. I think every uh, repeater operator owner uh, is a little over-enthusiastic about improving receiver sensitivity. So we tend to sometimes turn towards uh, preamplifiers. So what's the downside of having a preamplifier to boost up the receiver signal? Um, let's assume it's an RF quiet location. And the second part of the question is a heavy RF uh, shared location. So that'll be a quick one. Don't want to monopolize you. Let the others have a go. Thank you very much, Hayden. And we'll talk to you on uh, the other modes soon. Go yeah. ahead, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ron. Appreciate uh, appreciate that. And thanks again for for, uh, for all those words. Uh, yeah, so preamps. Um, Preamps. Uh, if if you've got an if you've got a quiet location and you find that the receiver you've tuned it as as best you can. So with with FM analog receivers, we tune for the best um, synad twelve dB synad reading. Uh, so best basically best signal to noise um, distortion. Um, if you if you want a number, uh, generally anything better than um, you know minus uh, 122 d dBm um, decibel to micro uh, microvolts, not microvolts, sorry, milli milli milliwatts. Yes, 
Um, milliwatts? Yes, dBm, uh, which is, I think is 0.25 of a microvolt, which is pretty, pretty good receiver. If you're starting to to want better than that, then and you've got an RF quiet location, then a preamp will make things a lot better. Um, and the a, a preamp can only really go in one location if you've got one antenna that you're transmitting it transmitting and receiving on. Because if you put a preamp between the antenna and the duplexer, you're going to blow it up because you're putting RF power through it. So you kind of have to put it in between the receiver and the duplexer. And then when you do that, you're probably not really gaining all that much because the preamp's there to make up for the cable losses. And if you've got cable loss before the preamp, then it's kind of really, it, it, it might work, but it might also not work that as well as what you think it is. If you've got two antennas, and you've got one separate receive antenna and one separate transmit antenna, then it will work really well. If you can put the preamp outside in a waterproof enclosure right at the antenna, it's going to work really well. Um, but uh, the disadvantages with using a preamp is, is that you uh, you open yourself up to um, your transmitter front-end overload uh, interference from other transmitters if you're on an rf site so preamps are I, I generally stay away from preamps and i don't really use them if i want to increase the performance i'll either use better coax or i'll use a better antenna or i'll try and reduce the loss in the duplexer and you'll probably more than likely get much better results at doing that um than using a preamp but um but yeah i mean preamps do work in in some situations for sure Yeah, thanks, Aidan. You actually answered my follow-up question about where I should put a preamp, so that's all good. I'll turn it over to Taranga. Thank you very much uh, from my behalf, on my behalf to all the participants uh, who rocked up here today. Big show. And uh, good night, Aidan. Good night, everybody else. I will be listening, but this will be my final. Go ahead, uh, Taranga. Uh, just also, uh, Thank you, Ron. Ron. Just in relation to the placement of preamps and preamps and stuff, if you go to the Repeater Builder website, which I mentioned in the resources, uh, there's like a whole article on preamps there, and it explains a lot more than the time that we have here on on using preamps. So that's uh, that uh, as with most stuff, um, if you want to find out more, there's 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 articles upon articles about stuff there, which is all all really good information. Yeah, thanks. Noted, Hayden. That's kind of the Bible of uh, the repeater user, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Taranga, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Ron. Thanks, Hayden. And uh, thanks, Ron, for connecting uh, Hayden with us, the Radio Society. So take care while driving back to work, Ron. Thanks so much. Uh, well, I have a question, uh, Hayden. Uh, well, one could still make a repeater if he's really run out of cash and if he's in a real hurry. He could still make a repeater using two handles, two cheap handles for under 50 bucks. Let's see. Why does not, uh, you know, you know, why doesn't it make a, a good repeater compared to the commercial uh, stable repeater? Why is not that uh, the repeater built with two handhelds or maybe a, a GM series Motorola is not that good as a commercial one? Yeah, so uh, the two handhelds, uh, you could definitely build a, a, a cheap repeater if you needed, you know, one to deploy quickly, maybe for emergency purposes or something like that. Um, I know that a lot of people use like two Baofeng radios um, together to to build a repeater out of. You mentioned the name, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, it, it'll work, um, but the problem with those radios is that uh, they're they're built to des they're designed to work over a very wide frequency range, so they don't have the best receivers in them. Uh, that's the first problem. So if you use them anywhere near any other transmitters, they're just not going to receive very well because the 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 receiver is just going to get overloaded with RF from other RF sources. So, uh, so that's that's one problem. The second problem is is if it's like a handheld um if it's like a handheld radio then uh they're they're not rated for a high duty cycle so 
uh, repeaters are obviously transmitting not just uh, when one side of the conversation's going, they're transmitting all the time. So they've got to have double the duty cycle of of the end user's radios. So for a handheld radio, that can mean that the radio heats up really quickly uh, and then it might fail, the finals might blow, something like that because it's got overheated. It's got It's not rated for that 100% duty cycle. Uh, so, uh, so that can be a problem as well. But... Uh, if you get, say, two Baofeng radios, um, you get a cheap UHF duplexer. You can get the little mobile, little mobile notch duplexers off eBay. They're like they're only like a eighty ninety dollars or something from China, I think. Now, um, you can build a, a and a and a. I think uh, you can also get a uh, what is it called? Um, there's a repeater controller which is really cheap as well. Um, Oh, it's gone out of my head what the what it is. Uh, it's like simple repeater controller or something like that. Um, IDO, that's it. Ideomatic, ideomatic. Um, you can get those; they're cheap as well. And you can you can build a, a little UHF repeater using two handhelds and that, um, and that'll work really well for portable and you know uh, emergency emergency comms. Setting up a repeater real quick, they'll work really good for that. Um, so yeah, you can, you can definitely, uh, you can definitely get away with that. Um, but the, the more commercial radios are built for a narrower frequency range. They have better filtering in their receiver. They have a, a larger heat sink on the repeaters to, and, and more, better duty cycle, um, better power amplifier circuits. So, uh, so they're more suited for that permanent installation on top of mountains and, and at repeater sites and stuff like that. Yeah. Super. Thanks, Aiden. Uh, Nadika, is, is your question related to this? Uh, yes, or shall act, I pass actually, to... <clears throat> actually, my question is related to this. Uh, Hayden, uh, now, uh, would, uh, uh, would uh, two uh, handhelds uh, work better on uh, cross-band uh, mode than in, in the simple, uh, single band uh, in that case? Yeah, yeah, probably. Um, and if you use two handhelds, using crossband um you don't need a duplexer um so well so depending on the depending on the quality of the handhelds they might still potentially suffer from front end overload so because the transmitter is so close to the receiver physically even if they're not close in frequency they might still wipe the transmitter might still wipe the receiver out um the other thing to think of with crossband is too, because uh, if you have a um, if you have your transmitter on two meters, you got to be careful of the third harmonic as well, because the third yeah. harmonic could land in the middle of seventy centimeters. So you don't want that as your receiver frequency. Um, but crossband would work really would work really well, yeah, with with a couple of handhelds and is a really cheap solution. Um, definitely. And, uh, if you can get a handheld that has crossband built into it or a mobile radio that has crossband built into it, then you only need one antenna as well. So you could just plug your antenna in, set it up in crossband mode and away you go. So yeah, yeah that, uh, that, that's a very good solution as well. If you, if you need a, a cheap, easy solution. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Nadika. And we have a question from uh, the Colombian waters. <laughs> Poet 7 Japan Lima, Poet 7 Juliet Lima Maritime Mobile uh, is having a question. Hayden, over to you, Jalia. Uh, hello, Hayden. How are you? This is for s 7 j Hi. Hayden, what do, what, what do you think about uh, isolators on uh, repeaters? That is my first question. Other one is uh, for planning a repeater site, uh, we are using this uh, radio mobile online for planning and getting the coverages. So are you using some other sort of a software for the planning? How yep. do you... Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so to, to answer your question, uh, the first one about isolators, yes, that's a very good one that I didn't cover because um, uh, it's kind of a little bit more in depth um, in, the, in the presentation. Isolators, are also, they're also known as circulators. So they're like a 
they're a magnetic one-way device um, that you put on your transmitter. Um, and what the purpose of that is, is to stop any um, any mixing in your power amplifier. So if there's any other transmitters, if you're on a, a on a shared site, or maybe even if you're not on a shared site, you might be several several kilometers away from another site, you can still get signals coming down into your transmitter, mixing, remixing a different signal, and then that being re-radiated out. And that can cause all sorts of interference, can interfere with your repeater, it can interfere with other repeaters. So if you put a isolator or a circulator on the output of your transmitter, um, then what will happen is, is that RF can only go one way. It can only go out. Um, and it can't come back in. If it comes back in, it'll go down into a, uh, usually they've got a dummy load attached. So it'll go straight into the dummy load. And there's a secondary benefit with an isolator or circulator in the fact that if your antenna goes bad, if you get highest WR on your antenna, your transmitter will never ever see that because all of your reflected power will come back down and into the dummy load. So, um, so that's uh, handy in, in, in that regard. Um, uh, for using an isolator. Um, if you are putting an isolator or a circulator on though, you want to make sure that that dummy load that's attached to it is rated for the output power of the radio. Um, because if you do have an, like an open circuit or something on your antenna, all of your RF power is going to be coming back and you want to make sure that it, it, um, it's got a, a load that's that's rated for the the correct um, amount of power. So, yeah, circulators and isolators are definitely if if you can use them on a on a uh, on a on a broadcast um, site with uh, on, on a site that has other receivers on them. So we've got we've got a a site that only has transmitters, broadcast transmitters on it. There's not really many receivers, so our repeater is probably the only receiver on the site. So we kind of get away with it because we're not going to interfere with that many people up there. Um, but uh, but I do actually have an isolator that I'm going to put on there eventually. I just haven't um, I just haven't uh, tuned it up, and I think I got I think I got it from Ron. So um, uh, yeah, so yeah, going to uh, to to look at that. Um, and uh, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Um, Coverage mapping tools. Oh yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've used Radio Mobile. So if you Google Radio Mobile, it allows you to put in your repeater site uh, uh, GPS coordinates, so where you want it, um, and it'll automatically calculate like the height and everything. And if you put in the frequency and the power and the loss and the other details that it asks for, it'll draw a plot of 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 a map and it will overlay it in I think green and yellow and it will show you this the predicted signal strengths. So yeah, you can use that to to model what your repeater is likely to to look like. Um, there was another program that I used to use, but I don't think it's freely available on the internet anymore. It was called Splat, I think, um, and that used to do the same thing, except you could import the, uh, sorry, export the map into like Google earth and you could view it in Google earth. Uh, but yeah, radio, radio mobile. That's the, that's what, uh, that's the main one I use. And it's, I think it's by a Canadian ham um, that runs that, uh, that web that website. Yeah. So, and, and it's free, it's free. Um, I just saw in the chat, someone posted the, the link to, to splat. Yes. Yes. That's the one. Um, I think with Splat you have to run it on your own PC. You, it, there used to be a web service that would um, do all the calculations for you, uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's that's the that's the program there. Yeah. Super. Uh, any more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, go ahead, Jerry. Go ahead. Uh, one, one thing. So, uh, well, well, roughly, so, so, uh, time to time, <clears throat> this is like a little bit of a crazy question. Uh, I know the coupling loops, I mean, the between the cavities, the duplex uh, cable is very important. But from duplex to uh, the transmit and the receiver, this cable length is uh, critical or it is not critical? Um. It it de it depends. So 
generally what I end up doing is, is I pick a cable length, which will reach from the receiver or the transmitter to the duplexer. And what I do is I then, uh, send a, if I, I test on the other end of the duplexer, I'll, uh, I've got a, um, service monitor, uh, or a test set, a spectrum analyzer. And what I'll do is I'll put the, uh, um, I'll inject a signal into the duplexer to make sure that the receiver's working correctly. It's still hearing and sensitive. And then I'll also test the transmit power out and make sure that there's no excess loss and calculate how much power I'm getting out. If it all looks fine, I generally just leave it. Uh, but sometimes there are some some you you might cut a cable and it might be like a quarter wave or it might be the wrong length um so uh i think the right answer is a half wavelength uh but an electrical half wavelength not a not a actual half wavelength but an electrical half wavelength so an electrical half wavelength is um taking into consideration the velocity factor of the cable so um, if you if you create a, a half wavelength or a full wavelength or multiple thereof, you'll you'll be about right because uh, with an electrical half wavelength or thereof, the input impedance is the same as the output impedance. So um, if you've got fifty ohms at your radio, you'll have fifty ohms at the other end of your cable. Your duplex is fifty ohms, and you'll you'll have your impedance matching correct. So I think that's the right answer, uh, but practically i just use whatever cables the correct length um, and it usually works so yeah okay hayden thank you very much uh, for your time and everything uh, thanks mate thank you right Nadika? yeah hayden what about the cable uh, length between the duplex and the antenna yeah uh, as short as possible <laughs> if you can okay. <laughs> um that's uh that's why I sort of recommend using low loss quality cable. Um but yeah, it's it's it, that that's not a critical length. That's just uh as short as possible, basically. Okay, yeah. Okay, guys, uh, do we have any more questions to Hayden? Oh. Hayden, have you ever forgotten a tool or a test equipment? <laughs> When you visit a repeater site and uh, cancel the whole trip and gone back, I I because... sorry I saw another question here in the chat. Um, uh, okay. Best place to insert uh, sent to me directly. Best ways to insert the isolator um, between the transmitter and the duplex, or between the duplex and the antenna. Ah, uh, no, between the the best place for the isolator is between the transmitter and the duplexer. Yeah. Um. Uh, sorry, what was the question about service monitor? No, uh, I was just asking, uh, have you ever forgotten a tool or a test oh. equipment in <laughs> one of your repeater visits and cancelled the whole trip and gone back? Uh, always. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the... <laughs> I I don't have a um I don't have a work vehicle or anything to keep all of my tools in. So my tools are sort of spread between various boxes and things. So whenever I'm planning to go to a repeater site, I try to pack everything that I think I might need, and then also pack the stuff that I know I won't need as well. Because I'm sure that when you get there, you'll need to you know have some special spanner or some special tool that you don't normally have uh in your in your toolkit but yeah i've forgotten you know uh uh allen keys and screwdrivers and uh the we've got a, a special um a coax prep tool which goes on the end of a drill and i've forgotten that and f knives and um i've even i think i've even forgotten an antenna once i've done i've forgotten all sorts of things before um and it's really difficult it's really like our repeater sites are not really that far away they're kind of i think the furthest one we've got from my house is oh it's probably one way it's about an hour and 20 minutes so you know it's if, if you if you're going there early enough then you it's it's very frustrating but you can go home and go back to the repeater site in one day 
So we have done that before. We've forgotten. I think we've, I think we forgot, we forgot something that we really, really needed and we didn't have any alternative. I think we also, uh, we forgot some drill, drill bits at a repeater site once. So it was quicker for us to drive down to the local hardware store and buy a new set of drill bits rather than going all the way home to get a second set. So, um, so we've done that as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Taranga. All right. Hello, that? Taranga. Okay, Ron. Go ahead. Yeah. I just pulled off the side of the road here for a curveball question for Hayden. Hayden, the uh, spectrum analyzers, network analyzers are expensive gizmos. And in the third world, people try and make do with, say, a nano VNA or an antenna analyzer. How close can you get with those in tuning a duplexer? Yeah, nano VNA you can get pretty close. Um, so yeah, you can you can you could use a nano VNA to to do your initial tuning, um, and then what I would do is uh, use you could even use just a, a watt meter or an SWR meter or something to 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 confirm that you're pretty close. So um, so once you tune up using your nano VNA. Maybe if you hook a handheld radio, you measure the output power of the handheld radio, five watts. You hook that into one side of the duplexer, say the transmit side, and then you hook your, your watt meter on the other side, and then you measure the output power. And if it's like two and a half watts, then you know you've got 3 dB of loss because you've lost half your power. So you can kind of get close with an NOV and A, definitely. Um, you, won't get it, you probably won't get it perfect just because of the resolution of a of a um uh uh just because of the resolution of an nano vna but yeah um you know it, it, as i think you mentioned you get by with the equipment that you have so you know um yeah you can definitely use those to to get close yeah i think though from the little experience i've had the tricky bit is the band reject side of it not the band pass as such yeah um, what I used to do in the old days, I used to put a dummy load on the other end and use an RF probe and tune it for maximum, or uh, minimum rather. Mm. Um, that, I think, works pretty well compared to trying to do it with a nano. But like I said, lots of people use it and uh, some people get by with it. But that's interesting, particularly um, in the context of the third world where spectrum analyzers can be very expensive. Anyway, yeah. thank you. I will put my car in gear again and off I go. Yeah, the the other thing you can also do is uh you can you can get away with stuff like that. Yeah, if you've got a like a a broadband noise generator or a or a, even I mean it's you you probably don't want to do it this way, but you you could put like a handheld on one side of the duplexer and then uh, tune the the notch or the or the reject side and then have your um. If you have your uh, tiny SA, your tiny spectrum analyzer, you can view the the carrier of the frequency that you're transmitting, and then you want to just reduce that carrier as much as possible on the on the frequency that you're trying to notch. So that's another way to do it. Um, but I uh, haven't used a tiny SA here. How do they compare with a nano, which is a network analyzer for the specific purpose that I was talking about? Yeah, so, good, tiny, yeah, 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 yeah. No, they're good. Um, the the tiny essays. Um, I've got one here which, um, I still got a. It's this is the the new one that I got from um AliExpress. This one goes up to four gigs, I think, and it's basically yeah, it's just a little little spectrum analyzer. Um, and you can connect it to your uh, you can connect it to your computer, and you can have the 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 spectrum plotted out on your computer. Uh, the only thing to be careful with them is is that they have a very, they'll only, um, uh, they've got a very low input power that you can put into them. I think it's like, I think it's maximum 10 dB that you can put in. So you need to have attenuators before them to make sure you don't put too much power into them. But yeah, they, they work very well and they're pretty cheap. I think I paid a hundred and, I think it was $150 Australian for this, which is not bad for a little spectrum analyzer that goes all the way up to uh four gigs so yeah pretty good Absolutely. all right thanks i'll be on my way have a good night everybody
Thanks, Ron. Over to you, Jalia. Uh, okay, Hayden, uh, last question. What, what, what do you think about uh, remote uh, receivers uh, uh, for the repeaters? <clears throat> yeah, so um, I mentioned towards the end of the slides that uh, on my YouTube channel, I've done a little bit with voting, um, voting and simulcasting. So uh, we have multiple receivers, which all tie back to one transmitter and they automatically choose between each receiver, um, which one's the best signal to noise. And then that gets sent to the repeater uh, for remote receivers. Uh, if you just got one, um, they can work well if they're not too far away from where the transmitter is, because I, I mentioned earlier on that you've got balancing. So you want to make sure that the transmitter and receiver in the system are, are kind of balanced. They're kind of the same. If your receiver is really, really good and it's say on a super quiet hill um, and your transmitter is on another hill, say a one or two kilometers away, then they're not going to, they might potentially might not cover the same areas. Uh, I think that the terms they use are um, all ears, all ears and no mouth. That's kind of a receiver based, you know, uh, receiver system that's, that's, uh, that's working the best, or it could be all mouth and no ears and, and uh, uh, one where a transmitters, you know, uh, putting out say say you've got a transmitter putting out 100 watts and your receiver is completely deaf or something like that people can hear the repeater but they can't get into it so there is a little bit of a balancing act but remote receivers work really well if uh, I think someone mentioned earlier on about commercial sites and getting your own spot on a commercial site uh, if you can I, there's there's a repeater in uh, the United States in Utah and what they did was is they had uh, they got access to a, a, a site with television and broadcast transmitters. So what they did was they put their transmitter at that site uh, because it was the highest up on the on the top of the mountain. And then what they did was they went down the side of the mountain a little bit. I think they went several hundred feet down the side of the mountain and they put their receiver down there because it was spaced further away from all of the transmitters up on the top and they actually had better performance from their receiver at that location because it was a lot more rf quiet and what they did was they then linked it back i think they linked it um they didn't do it over rf i think they ran a i think they ran a cable i think they ran several hundred meters of cable um but you could do it over rf and uh they ran that and that was essentially a remote receiver and it worked really really well um and uh yeah so sometimes that's that's definitely an option yeah right oh, thank okay. you Aiden. jalia you want to add anything uh no uh, taranga please go ahead right right uh victor for your seven vk are you there victor yeah 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 taranga i'm here yeah yeah uh quick question to uh hayden wouldn't want to take too much time. Uh, right. Just one uh, question regarding uh, sharing repeater frequencies. Now, Sri Lanka is a small island, maybe the size of uh, Tasmania or so, 25,000 km, uh, square kilometers. So our telecom, since we have only two megahertz, you know, they're asking us whether we can't share. Well, we have a repeater down south and we have one in the city. It's about 150 kilometers apart. And there are some mountain ranges in between, but there is a chance of about say 10% overlapping, you know, chances. Have you had, uh, or would you say not to touch, uh, you know, this uh, sharing uh, repeater frequencies, try to get it off? Or if we have to, do you think it will be advantageous to uh, have, uh, for instance, um, input, uh, change the input of one will be uh, an output that way. Any uh, quick thoughts on that without taking too much of your time? Yeah. Yeah. Um... We, we, so what we do here is when we submit an application for a repeater or a new repeater channel, uh, it goes via a central location and they do all those checks for us to make sure that they're not going to interfere with another one on a similar frequency. Um, so we kind of, we do have to think about it, but they kind of make that decision. Um, as far as that situation that you've got there as well, you're probably right with 150 kilometers difference between the two, unless they're 
uh, unless there's obvious places where you could hear both repeaters at the same time, it's probably not really going to be too much of a, of a problem over that kind of distance. Um, we've got, we don't, we've got enough uh, channels here where we can space them out um, so that we don't have interference between our repeaters. Uh, the other option is, is you could also use digital as well, which reduces the bandwidth even more. But if it's just analog that you're talking about, you're probably, uh, you're probably, will not have too many problems being on the same frequency pair over that kind of distance. Um, if you were to flip the input and outputs, that's probably not a good idea because uh, the repeaters might be able to hear each other. And if you flip the inputs and outputs, they'll be talking to each other all day. Um, whereas, yeah, uh, uh, the end, if, if, you hear, if you're hearing two repeaters at the same time, you have to hear them at a similar signal strength um, because on FM, uh, it's it, it's actually a good thing. On FM, we have a thing called the capture effect, which basically means your receiver is going to hear the same. Uh, sorry, your, your receiver is going to hear the strongest repeater. So whichever one is the strongest, you're going to hear that one over the other one. It's only when you hear them within about 10 dB of one another when you hear them about the same signal strength is when you'll hear the doubling and you'll hear the mixing. So uh, if you've got um, issues with, um, you know, co-channel interference and, and interference on the same channel, um, then uh, I think that, I think that you'll be okay over that sort of distance. But yeah, if you can space them out, then, then it's probably best. The other thing uh, that you could also do too is if you, I'm not sure how much bandwidth you've got on 70 centimeters on UHF, um, but you can also um, maybe rather than having say one VHF repeater, you might be able to set up say two UHF repeaters um, that are both linked and they might have the same coverage area as that one UH, uh, VHF one. And then you don't have to worry about the the one at the North end of the Island or the South or whichever is the problem. I hope that helps. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a bit, uh, it's kind of a bit, uh, you know, there's a few other things I'm sure I don't really know the topography or the, you know, what it's like there, but, uh, but uh, I'm assuming that they can't yeah. see each other or anything yeah. like that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Taranga. Yeah. Thanks Victor. Nadika. Yeah. Just to add uh, to what Hayden said, uh, I think uh, everybody in Sri Lanka can remember that we had uh, a problem with our repeaters looping each other with the Indian repeaters uh, when oh. the, when the conditions were very good. Uh, I mean, yeah. the conditions were very good. Our main repeater in Sri Lanka was on a, a plus shift, and uh, it was uh, looping with uh, uh, in, uh, very strong Indian repeater, and we had that problem here. So um, actually, you you just um, I thought of a different solution. So we have a similar problem here where we've got a repeater in the north of our state, uh, which is on the same frequency as one on the mainland. And it's not normally a problem until we get the ducting and we get the good conditions. So what happened was is one of the repeaters used a CT CSS um, access tone so that what would happen is that whenever someone uh, tried to use that repeater, they had to have the correct tone. Uh, we didn't do it on the second repeater, but if you wanted to, you could have two different tones. And then that way, you're only going to be able to access one repeater at a time. There are chances that you might hear them both at the same time. You know, uh, if you're in the right spot, you might hear them both. But at least you know you're only going to be getting into one yeah. or the other. So... Um, that's another way. I didn't even think about other countries because uh, you, you're pretty close to to a couple there. So uh, we don't really have that problem here. We're only sort of yeah. close to New Zealand, or well, sort of close to New Zealand. So. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sir. Right. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Well, uh, do we have any any more questions before we wrap up for today? I think uh, Aiden spent a little over two hours with us this evening. There, there was another yeah there was another one in the chat uh sent to me again uh um about a using an isolator on the receiver input um i don't really i don't really think that that would 
give any kind of advantage. Um, it's probably be easier or better to use filtering um, cavity filters, bandpass filters on the receiver to to rather than an isolator. So yeah. Thank you so much, Hayden, for spending, as I said, uh, over two hours with us. And uh, you spent, uh, you must have spent a lot more time than this uh, preparing the slides. So thanks uh, very much on behalf of the Radio Society. Uh, would love to have you once again, uh, or maybe a few times <laughs> more uh, to do similar sessions. And uh, would love to see you in person at eyeball level as well, uh, <laughs> Hayden. So visit uh, during one of these uh, uh, matches, cricket matches in, uh, in, <laughs> in an upcoming tournament. We'd love yeah. to host you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Maybe. We'll see how we go. Thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah. and uh, to add any closing remarks, uh, let me pass to Vic, uh, uh, our club secretary. And uh, yeah, from my, my end, thank you so much and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Taranga Hayden, thank you very much for giving us your valuable time. You're a great celebrity. Sorry, I hope I don't embarrass you by saying that, but we have been following you. And it's a great privilege for us to have you on board today and answering our questions and giving us a good round up of uh, repeaters. I know we have a lot of people who are on our repeaters, but only a few of them really go to their sites to do the work. So this was very revealing from, uh, from, the, from their side of view also, a point of view. So thank you so much. I won't go into too many details, but to say thank you very much. And as Taranga said, Australia and Sri Lanka are not too far apart. You know, if I look at the map, it's just about four <laughs> or five inches away. And you are welcome in Sri Lanka. Thank Anytime you. Anytime you, and there are some direct flights, uh, you know, from between Sydney and Colombo and Melbourne and Colombo. Please take our invitation. If any day you get the time and incline come this way, you'll be our guest. No two words about it. We'll pick you up from the airport and we will <laughs> deposit you back at the airport once you've finished going through Sri Lanka. Thank you once again on behalf of all our members and uh, uh, so much for that we have gathered in the last uh, one and a half or two hours. Thank you once again and take care and continue the fantastic work you are, you are doing for the amateur community all over the world. Thank you once again and over to you, Taranga. Thanks, Victor. All right, Hayden. Uh, hopefully, we can see this uh, recording very soon on your on your yeah. channel as well. Yeah, right. I'll uh, I'll definitely make sure that I uh, that I upload this. Um, thank you very very much. It's been an honor and a privilege to be able to talk to uh, to all of you today, and um, for uh, for inviting me in as your uh, as your guest. Uh, I'm really. Uh, Appreciate it. Uh, I apologize if the I, I kind of towards the end of the presentation I did rush a little bit. I did notice how the time was running away. So I'm hoping that uh, if you did didn't catch something, then obviously when the recording comes out, you can uh, go back and and have a watch through that. And if anyone else uh, is if anyone's interested in in helping out with the repeaters uh, over there as well, uh, definitely find whoever's you know, um, doing the work and maybe just uh, uh, go along with them to the repeater site and just see what it's all about and how it works. And uh, the more knowledge we spread, uh, the uh, the more uh, easier it becomes for everybody. And we uh, share the share the load a little bit. So and you get to learn a little bit and have a bit of fun. So yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Taranga, and uh, everyone else. Uh, appreciate uh, you having me. <laughs>